So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today to talk to you about the work that I've been doing during my postdoc in Brett Finley's lab. So I'm going to be discussing uh, some of the work our lab has been doing on interactions between the gut microbiota and attaching and effacing pathogens. So for anybody who might not be familiar with this group of pathogens, attaching and effacing pathogens are the ones that can make an attaching and effacing lesion, which looks something like this here. So what you see is the effacement or the destruction of the microvilli, uh, coupled to a close adherence of the pathogen to the host epithelium. Um, and you also get the formation of this actin pedestal structure underneath the bacteria. The ability to make this type of attaching and effacing lesion is due to the pathogens carrying a pathogenicity island called the locus of enterocyte effacement, or the LEE, uh, which encodes a type 3 secretion system and uh, some of the effectors that are needed to cause this type of uh, lesion. So there are numerous different attaching and effacing pathogens that are known, but these three I've listed here are probably the best studied. There are two human pathogens. The first is enteropathogenic E. coli, or EPEC, um, which is only known to infect humans, and its site of infection is the small intestine. Whereas the other human pathogen, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or EHEC, also has a major reservoir in cattle, which it infects asymptomatically. Unlike EPEC, EHEC prefers to reside in the colon, and it can also cause a more severe disease due to the presence of the Shiga toxin in those strains. Um, so neither of these human pathogens infect mice very well, and so in order to model attaching and effacing pathogenesis in a mouse model, we use this organism, Citrobacter rodentium, which is a natural pathogen of mice that also carries the Lee pathogenicity island. And like EHEC, it um, infects mainly the large intestine of its host. So uh, something that I find really interesting about particularly EHEC and Citrobacter that are infecting the large intestine is that they are infecting a, an, an area of the body that's already very heavily colonized by the gut microbiota. So as I'm sure most of us know, the density and the diversity of the microbiota tends to increase as you uh, go down the digestive tract. And um, what's really remarkable is that EHEC can uh, not only colonize the host with an infectious dose of around 500 CFU, but it can actually proliferate to really high levels, even in the presence of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12, perhaps, bacteria in the colon. So some of the questions that come out of this fact are, um, how does the gut mi microbiota affect the ability of these pathogens to infect their host? And also, how do pathogens sense and respond to the microbiota, given that they're such a major part of the gut environment? So first, I'm going to discuss some of the work that our lab has done on looking at how microbiota affect the outcome of infection. So one way that you can look at this is by uh, using a mouse model where you treat the mice with antibiotics. And this is work that was done by Marta Vladarska, who was a previous PhD student in our lab. What Marta did was to give mice various antibiotics in their drinking water for four days prior to infection with Citrobacter, and then she sacrificed the animals at six days post-infection to look at colonization and tissue damage. So interestingly, Marta saw that um, regardless of whether you didn't treat the mice or you gave them streptomycin or metronidazole in their drinking water, the colonization of Citrobacter in the cecum of these mice stayed relatively similar. Um, so there wasn't a big effect on pathogen colonization. However, she did notice a big difference in the uh, pathology that she saw in this model. So the metronidazole-treated animals had much more tissue damage resulting from the citrobacter infection than did the untreated or the streptomycin-treated mice. So metronidazole and the changes that it causes to the microbiota somehow increases the severity of citrobacter-induced colitis. Marta went on to look a little bit more into the mechanism of how this might be happening. And as ha has already been mentioned in several talks, the mucus layer in the gut is really important for protection uh, of the epithelium against bacteria. So Marta looked at the thickness of the inner mucus layer. That's the one that's right up against the epithelium and is very dense and normally devoid of bacteria. And she saw that treatment with streptomycin didn't have a big effect on the thickness of that inner mucus layer but treatment with metronidazole did decrease the thickness of the inner mucus layer, which you can see in a numerical form there. So what does this mean for citrobacter infection? 
Well, Marta looked at the localization of Citrobacter in the colons of these mice using immunofluorescence. And what she was able to see was that early on in inf infection, even at four days post-infection, um, in the metronidazole treated animals, you start to see a lot of localization of the Citrobacter very near to the host epithelium, which you don't observe so much in the untreated animals. And then by day six post-infection, you're seeing even more localization of the Citrobacter very close to the epithelium and also penetration into the crypts. And so this explains how um, the metronidazole could be causing this more severe tissue damage to occur. So normally, uh, microbiota are sending signals to the host to promote the maintenance and thickness of this mucus layer, but metronidazole disrupts that protective influence of the microbiota, so you see thinning of the mucus layer, and then this allows Citrobacter to get close to the epithelium sooner in infection and cause more tissue damage. Another way that you can look at the ability of the microbiota to protect the host from infection with these attaching and effacing pathogens is by looking at the susceptibility of different mouse strains to infection with Citrobacter. So it's been known for quite a few years now that most mouse strains, um, when they're infected with Citrobacter, will develop a self-limiting infection. So in most mouse strains, you see about 80 to 100% survival of the Citrobacter infection, and it's usually cleared by about four weeks post-infection. However, in a few strains, like C3H, HEJ, the mice actually develop a lethal infection. And so Ben Willing, who is a previous postdoc in the lab, asked the question of whether strain differences between uh, the microbiota of these mice might be one of the factors that contributes to their different sensitivity to Citrobacter infection. To test this, Ben did a fecal transplantation experiment where he took feces from the C3H HEJ susceptible mice and also the NIH Swiss resistant mice and transplanted them into the susceptible host. And then he infected the mice with Citrobacter. So what you can see is that the mice that received the mock transplantation from the sensitive strain still um, died post Citrobacter infection whereas the ones that received the transplantation from the resistant strain um, were somewhat protected from the citrobacter-induced lethality. So transplantation of the resistant microbiota was able to improve survival of citrobacter infection. One of the mechanisms that Ben looked into that might account for this was um, some cytokine signaling through IL-22, and Ben chose to look at IL-22 because it was previously shown to be induced by the microbiota, and also to be important for uh, the ability of black six mice to clear Citrobacter infection. So it seemed like a reasonable candidate for how microbiota could be promoting survival of Citrobacter infections. So Ben measured the amount of IL-22 in the guts of these animals, and he found not only is there a higher amount of IL-22 to start out in the resistant mice compared to the sensitive mice here, but when you transplant the microbiota from the resistant mice into the sensitive mice, you get a big increase in IL-22 production relative to um, the mock transplantation with the sensitive microbiota. And in accordance with this, two of the antimicrobial peptides that are regulated by IL-22, which are REG3-gamma and REG3-beta, were also found in higher levels in the resistant mice and in the um, resistant microbiota transplanted mice than in the sensitive mice. So transplantation of the resistant microbiota did increase IL-22 expression. So is this actually important for protection of the mice from Citrobacter infection? To do this, uh, Ben used an immunoneutralizing antibody against IL-22 that will prevent IL-22 from having these protective effects like increasing expression of antimicrobial peptides. And then he looked at whether um, the transplantation of resistant microbiota could still protect from Citrobacter. So all of the mice that he tested here were of the sensitive background and had received the resistant microbiota. Some of them received the immunoneutralizing anti-IL-22 antibody, and some received the isotype control. And what you can see in this survival curve is that the ones that lost function of IL-22 with this immunoneutralizing antibody um, died faster, so they had a shorter median survival time compared to the ones that received the isotype control and still had functional IL-22. So this tells us that IL-22 probably accounts for part of the protective effect of the resistant microbiota in this model. So put together, these studies really show us that the gut microbiota has a big effect on the ability of attaching and effacing pathogens to 
infect their host. So they're a really important part of the environment for these pathogens. So then this leads to the question of how do the pathogens respond to this challenge? How do they sense the presence of the microbiota? And then how do they um, express mechanisms to cope with that challenge? So in order to address that question, I've been using an RNA-seq approach to look at how EHEC, the human pathogen, responds to microbiota-produced metabolites. And the source of microbiota metabolites that I'm using for this experiment is a defined community of 33 human gut isolates that, call, that is called Microbial Ecosystem Therapeutic 1, or MET1. Um, it previously went by the much more catchy name of Repupulate, but um, our collaborators have decided to rename this community, so it's MET1 now. Um, so what I'm using here in the experiments is the flow-through cell-free cell uh, supernatant from a chemostat culture of all of these 33 isolates being grown together. So I grew EHEC in this condition, and then I needed to compare its gene expression in the presence of these microbiota supernatants or to some controls. And so I used two controls for this experiment. One control is the sterile unused chemostatin medium to be the medium control. Um, but it's important to note that there are a couple of differences between the microbiota supernatant and the chemostat medium. So one is obviously that you have the presence of microbiota produ produced metabolites in the supernatant, which is what I want to look at. But of course, the microbiota have also taken out some of the nutrients from the chemostat medium. So there's also a loss of some nutrients in the supernatant compared to the complete medium. So in order to account for that, I did a third condition, which was a starvation control, which was just water. And then to allow EHEC to grow in the water, I added concentrated M9 glucose to basically give a minimal media. And I added that to all three of the conditions to make sure that EHEC would have the uh, minimal nutrients required for growth in all cases. So what we expect to see in this type of experimental setup is that if we have an EHEC gene that's regulated by nutrient starvation, then it should be expressed the most highly in the starvation control, the minimal M9 medium with nothing added to it. Um, on the other hand, if uh, we should see the lowest expression of this gene in the complete medium used from the chemostat culture, and then somewhere in between for the microbiota supernatant. Now, the other types of genes, which are the ones that we really want to look at, are the ones that are specifically regulated by microbiota metabolites. And in this case, we should see that they have the highest expression in the microbiota supernatant condition and then uh, comparative expression in the other two conditions. So when we applied these kinds of filters to our RNA-seq results, looking for genes that were either upregulated at least twofold or downregulated at least twofold in the microbiota supernatant compared to either of the controls um, to help us find those specifically microbiota-regulated genes, we found 117 genes that were upregulated and 44 that were downregulated. They belong to a number of different COG categories. Um, only one of these was significantly enriched in the RNA-seq results, and this was amino acid transport and metabolism. We don't know uh, specifically why this is, but my best guess is that the chemostat medium contains a lot of insoluble proteins like mucins that are normally filtered out of the medium um, before we grow EHEC in it. So, I think during the chemostat culture, when the microbiota are growing, they're probably cleaving off some amino acids and some oligopeptides from those insoluble proteins. And then maybe EHEC is able to use those for uh, growth substrate in the supernatant condition. Another way that we can look at the results from this RNA-seq experiment is to look for what are the most strongly upregulated or most strongly downregulated EHEC genes in the presence of the microbiota metabolites. And I've shown those here. So these are the genes whose expression changed at least five-fold relative to either of the other controls. And if we look at the downregulated genes here, out of the 12 most strongly downregulated genes, we saw that five of them were involved in biotin biosynthesis. So what exactly is biotin? I'm sure we've probably all heard of it before. But as a refresher, um, it's an essential coenzyme that's found in all three domains of life. It's really important in the process of fatty acid biosynthesis. And bacteria like EHEC have several ways that they can obtain their biotin. So they can obtain it from the environment. And YIG-M is the high affinity biotin transporter that brings it into the EHEC cell. EHEC can also make biotin itself. 
So it possesses these two uh, operons encoding the biotin biosynthetic machinery that will convert a whole bunch of precursor molecules into biotin that the bacteria can then use to grow. Now, in the presence of external biotin being present in the environment, um, biotin is able to bind to this regulatory protein, BRA, and then BRA will act as a repressor to turn off expression of the biosynthetic genes since if you can just take up biotin from the environment, you probably don't want to spend the effort to synthesize it yourself. So this is what we figured was probably happening, is that the microbiota were excreting biotin into the um, environment, which could then be taken up through YIG-M and repress expression of these biosynthetic genes. So I went on to look at that in a little bit more detail. In order to do that, I made a BioB reporter by fusing the BioB promoter to the LUC CDABE operon. And then I looked at the expression of this reporter in two different strains of EHEC. So you can see in the wild type strain of EHEC here, um, when you add biotin to the culture, it represses the expression of the BioB reporter even at very low concentrations. So this first, or second bar, I should say here, is five nanomolars biotin, and um, it shows basically full repression compared to the no nanomolars of biotin added control. Now, when you repeat this experiment with a YIG-M mutant, which is one that can't transport uh, biotin efficiently across its inner membrane, now you see that these lower concentrations of biotin are no longer able to repress expression of BioB, and it takes about a thousand-fold thousand more biotin being added to the culture before you start to see any repression of the biotin biosynthetic genes there. So external biotin does repress expression of this operon as we expect it to. So what's going on in the microbiota supernatant? We used a commercially available kit to measure the concentration of biotin both in the chemostat medium and also in the microbiota supernatant. And we found that even in the sterile medium, the level of biotin was fairly high, around 5 micromolar. But in the supernatant, it was substantially higher than that, around 80 micromolar. Now, when you grow EHEC uh, carrying the BioB reporter in the presence of the different culture conditions that were used in RNA-seq, you can see that expression of BioB is highest in the M9 minimal medium control, as you would expect. It decreases in the medium control, and then it's lowest in the supernatant control, as you would expect if there is biotin present, as we saw from this experiment. And then when you use the YIG-M mutant, um, you've now taken away the ability of EHEC to efficiently transport biotin across the inner membrane, and so you don't really get any substantial um, decrease in expression when you compare the medium and the microbiota supernatant here. And so together, these experiments have demonstrated that the microbiota used in this 33 isolate community do secrete a substantial amount of biotin, at least during growth in vitro. And um, this microbiota-derived biotin is able to repress EHEC biotin biosynthesis genes. And I'll talk a little bit more about the significance of that in a couple minutes. So before that, I just want to mention one other category of genes that we noticed in our really strongly regulated gene set. And these are um, a number of stress response genes that we found upregulated in the presence of the microbiota metabolites. Um, these include a number of different stress responses. So CPXP and SPI are envelope stress response genes. And then SOX-S is part of the oxidative stress response. We also have an osmotic stress response gene. Um, and so this fits really well with the idea of uh, stress responses as being competition sensing. We have a whole bunch of different stress responses being activated by this microbiota supernatant. The ones that we're currently working on following up on a little bit more are these poorly characterized stress response genes, YHCN and BHSA. So there's a little bit currently known about these two proteins. They're small envelope localized proteins, um, and they both sh uh, share a conserved domain of unknown function called DUF1471. Um, this is the crystal structure of that domain from one of the paralogs of these proteins. And we don't really know what these proteins do, but we do know that E. coli has nine paralogous proteins that all have this domain and that all seem to be localized to the envelope. So it's been kind of hypothesized that they might have some sort of role in um, interactions with other cells, such as in biofilms or those types of environments. And from experiments done in E. coli K12, 
we know that mutants in these two genes have problems with biofilm formation, and they're also more susceptible to a variety of stresses, including hydrogen peroxide and things like heat and acid. Um, so we're currently working on trying to understand a little bit better what these genes might be doing in EHEC, especially in the context of the microbiota. So we can see by doing just a quick crystal violet assay that biofilm formation, although it is not strongly affected in the single mutants of these genes compared to wild type EHEC, it is pretty substantially decreased in a double mutant lacking both YHCN and BHSA, which suggests they might have some sort of functional redundancy. And another way that uh, we can start to look into how, what function these genes might have is to think about how they're regulated. So for this experiment, I made Lux reporters for both YHCN and BHSA. And then I looked at the expression of these reporters, not only in the three conditions that were used in the RNA-seq, which you can see on the left side of the graph, graph here, um, but also in supernatants from individual isolates. So each of the 33 isolates that are part of the community, we have individual supernatants from those. And what we saw was that the individual isolate that most strongly activated expression of both of these genes was actually the same isolate. And um, this is a strain of acidaminococcus intestini, which is activating expression of both YHCN and BHSA. So this suggests a couple of things to us. First of all, these genes might be co-regulated in, in addition to sharing this conserved domain and possibly having some functional redundancy. And then it also suggests that this acidaminococcus organism might have some type of an antagonistic relationship with EHEC if it's activating these stress-responsive genes. So just to put our findings so far into context, um, this is an overview of the infection strategy for attaching and effacing pathogens. So when these pathogens enter the colon, they don't really want to be hanging out in the lumen here where there's a lot of other competing microbes. What they really want to do is get through the lumen, through the inner mucus layer, or sorry, outer mucus layer that still has a lot of microbes in it, through the inner mucus layer and attach directly to the host epithelium where they have essentially no competing organisms and um, that seems to be their preferred niche. So how might sensing of microbiota metabolites help them out in this type of strategy? Well, we've shown that uh, microbiota organisms do secrete biotin and that EHEC is able to sense and able to take up this microbiota-derived biotin. So this could be one way of just gaining a growth advantage of taking up vitamins from your environment so you don't have to make them yourself. Um, but there could be another potential advantage in this for EHEC. So mammalian cells aren't capable of producing biotin. So all of the biotin in the gut is either going to be synthesized by the microbiota or coming in through the diet. And so this sets up a sort of gradient of this nutrient where you're going to have higher levels of biotin in the lumen and then lower levels of biotin um, near the surface of the epithelium where EHEC likes to attach to the host cells. It's been recently shown that several strains of EHEC can actually use biotin as a cue to repress type 3 secretion. And this might make a lot of sense if you think about this in terms of EHEC's localization in the gut. So if there's lots of microbiota out in the lumen and in the outer mucus layer secreting a high level of biotin, this will allow EHEC to repress its type 3 secretion system where it's not really needed. And then by the time EHEC makes it to the epithelial surface where there's a much lower amount of biotin present, then this repression will be alleviated and EHEC will go on to express its type 3 secretion system and cause disease. Um, in addition, we've also seen that acidaminococcus intestini is producing some sort of metabolite that we have no idea what it is right now, potentially more than one metabolite, that EHEC is able to sense and that causes upregulation of BHSA and YHCN and potentially other stress response genes. So this is completely speculative right now about what, what type of effect this might have for EHEC. But um, we can speculate that since the epithelial surface is EHEC's preferred niche and it cannot cause an infection if it can't localize to the surface of the epithelium, that's probably where it does most of its growth and replication type functions. So out in the lumen and in the outer mucus layer where it's going to find higher levels of this mystery metabolite here, um, EHEC probably doesn't really want to be in a growth and replication type of lifestyle 
um, it's probably more advantageous for EHEC to be in more of a biofilm formation or more of a stress resistance type of lifestyle. And sensing these uh, microbiota metabolites might be one way of EHEC helping to uh, make those lifestyle type decisions. So I'd like to wrap up by thanking everybody in the Findlay Lab, especially Brett, and especially the people whose work I uh, discussed today, Marta and Ben. And I'd also like to give a big thanks to our collaborator, Emma Allen Verco, who's done a lot of culturing of not very nice smelling microbiota for us. Um, so she's been a big help in that regard. And thank you to all of you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.